Hello, everyone. Hello. Woo. Woo. Are we excited to be here? Welcome to the Philips Wearables Challenge Pitch Off. I'm Jennifer Joe. I'm Jim Ryan. And we're the co founders of MedJo and MedTech Boston, uh, the organizers of the challenge, and we'll be your MCs for the evening. <laughs> we're so excited that Philips is invested in medical innovation um, and the community and is the sponsor of the challenge that has culminated in this lovely evening tonight. So you are about to watch six teams uh, that competed online over the last three months. Uh, they came out on top and they will be competing for three prizes. The first prize is $10,000, the second prize is $5,000, the third prize is $2,500. And it's going to be Shark Tank style, I guess I can say Shark Tank, but tell you we're not affiliated with the TV show. Um, <laughs> but we do have some sharks. <laughs> we, yes, we have our sharks, which we'll be introducing you soon. And they will make the decision on those uh, three top prizes. Um, but how did we come up with these six finalists? We all know that innovation doesn't happen in a bubble. It's an open dialogue and a collaborative process. And for that reason, Philips launched their wearables challenge this July. For the past three months, Clinicians, engineers, patients, innovators have all um, submitted their ideas from around the country for using wearables to predict early signs of patient deterioration and to prevent hospital readmissions. 19 expert judges weighed in and guided the submitters. We had over 2,000 of you who voted from across the world. Our panel of expert judges and their overall community provided tons of feedback to the participants, and the challenge garnered over 3,500 followers and 75,000 page views. Thank you to you, the online judges and Phillips for contributing to supporting the innovation community and choosing these six finalists. So first up, oops, sorry, I don't know why I'm so much louder. <clears throat> first up, uh, to get us started off, um, we have our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Calum McRae. Uh, he's the chief of cardiovascular medicine uh, at Brigham and Women's Hospital. And Dr. McRae, his clinical focus is in cardiovascular clinical genetics. Um, he's the co-director of uh, genomic medicine at Brigham and Women's. And most recently, um, he was awarded a very large grant from the One Brave Idea Initiative, which is funded by the American Heart Association, uh, Verily Life Sciences, which is Google's life science division, and AstraZeneca. Um, he beat out hundreds of other applicants from around the world to receive this award, and it provides him uh, five years of uh, support for research um, focused on uncovering the causes of heart disease, um, including previously unrecognized signals marking the transition from wellness to disease. So welcome to the stage, Dr. Kalen McRae. Jim, thank you very much. Uh, if any of you have a sensor for jet lag, I'm sure you're uh, off scale at the moment because I just got back from Japan uh, after I got caught in a typhoon. So uh, I may be a little bit snoozy. Uh, I am uh, excited to be here. Uh, I think one of the things, as Jim mentioned, that we're trying to do in this One Brave Idea program uh, is to build uh, essentially public-private partnerships. And so one of the key elements that we're looking for are sensors that actually offer insight into new biology and uh, coronary artery disease or atherosclerosis. So think about that as you're going through, uh, as I'm going through what I'm going to tell you about. I think at the core uh, of everything that we're trying to do is, is connect uh, care and discovery. And ultimately, if the information content is high enough, those two actually end up being the same thing. Uh, this is uh, a crude cardiologist's view of a learning health system. Uh, I love this particular uh, uh, laptop with a stethoscope coming out of it, blending the 18th century and the 20th century. But ultimately, we need to move beyond all of these if we're really going to get at the underlying biology. Um, ultimately, the, the host of uh, decisions that we need to make uh, with any analytic engine that we might uh, consider using, whether it's a physician or a uh, a uh, modern AI platform is going to need the right inputs and outputs. And what I'm going to really uh, talk to you very briefly about is what we feel from our standpoint, at least in the cardiovascular space, which is where a lot of devices are really being built and created, uh, is at the core of what we need to be looking for. Uh, I think the things that are missing are highlighted here. And ultimately, 
Uh, the single most important things I believe that are missing from most wearable sensors that are in use today, most sensors that are in use in medicine today, are actually information content and biology. Almost everything that we look at is a legacy 18th century trait uh, that, to be 100% honest, has never really proven of much predictive utility. There are a couple of reasons for that. One is they tend to have been identified on the basis of disease and not health. And secondly, they almost never, almost never, have any associated metadata that allow you to compare them across uh, populations. So people are making uh, really massive investments in measuring heart rate with wear wearables. We've had 20 years of 10 million people with direct intracardiac recordings from the highest risk groups. And in that situation, with all the AI that you can imagine deploying, there wasn't a single uh, uh, modicum of additional information content. And so at the core of what I believe we need to be thinking about is why is it that the, the sensors that we have used in the past, in the last 50 years, the sensors that we're building as we move forward are going to succeed or fail? What are the features that we need to be looking for in order to identify them? In every field in medicine, whether it's genetics, clinical trial stratification, or care redesign, these are the uh, perfectly overlapping curves for four trials of telehealth and heart failure readmission not one of which affected outcomes, even uh, contrived outcomes like 30-day readmission rates, which although they're of great economic value, have almost no value to the patients themselves. Well, ultimately, it's the fact that the phenotypes we measure are the rate-limiting step, that most of them are static or very limited in dynamic range. They're almost all aggregates of uh, lots of different underlying biologies. And as I mentioned, uh, they're almost all free from any organizing metadata. So a heart rate of 30 is compatible with you being asleep, with you being dead, with you being a super athlete, with lots of things. But you can't tell the difference between any of those unless you have the right uh, metadata, and to be honest, historical metadata as well. Uh, the ultimate problem, I think, is the scale and scope of what we're trying to measure. If you add every single thing that you can possibly measure and bill for in clinical medicine, in North America today, it comes up to about 9,800 phenotypes. And that includes 60 discrete metrics of diastolic relaxation parameters in the, in the left ventricle. It's hardly surprising with only 10 to the 4 phenotypes that we're unable to deconvolute a genome at 10 to the, 10 to the 9, far less all of these other data sets uh, that are completely unbounded, unlike the genome, which is at least, uh, if nothing else, you know the limits of the genome. Uh, and then if you think about it in terms of the associated metadata, exposures are probably one of the most important conditioning variables. We measure almost no conditioning variables in anything that we do. And so what we've begun to think about are, is a systematic approach to moving beyond some of these legacy traits. Uh, I think one of the best examples is diabetes. Uh, so this is the sort of the repertoire of the clinician ma managing diabetes. Uh, this is somewhat exaggerated, but it's essentially the electronic health record, a semi-subjective record of subjective opinion, uh, which never really augurs well, no matter how much natural language processing you deploy, uh, and an 18th century test that is based on the taste of the urine, literally the taste of the urine. And unfortunately, we built our entire implementation platform around this, and so it was very difficult to move on from this, because this is the only thing you get paid for, is blood sugar and urinary uh, sugar. Uh, despite the fact that 15 years ago, uh, Rob Gerson and his colleagues at the BI showed that there are branch chain amino acid abnormalities that antedate any detectable glucose um, uh, perturbation in the human by about uh, 12 to 15 years. Uh, there are capillary uh, abnormalities that are detectable by um, single fiber confocal at the bedside that are present even when you're born in a, in a subset of individuals who go on to develop diabetes. There are abnormalities of the way in which you radiate heat, the way in which your lipid uh, subtypes are distributed across your body that antedate your uh, diabetic history. Uh, there are even uh, simple distribution effects uh, of growth pat patterning in your long bones and in your uh, central skeleton that actually predict whether or not you'll be diabetic. In fact, one of the most interesting things about this is a slightly trite example, but possibly the most rigorous and, and the only unified standardized phenotype in diabetes that allows you to pull out Mendelian forms of the trait is shoe size, because at least in shoe size, there's an internationally accepted uh, set of metrics. Uh, the electrocardiogram also turns out to be quite an important predictor of the underlying biology of diabetes, but we never ever think about putting all these together in some multidimensional uh, or even some uh, modest dimensional fashion. Um, 
I think that in summary, almost every trait that we think about in disease, whether it's pr blood pressure, glucose, lipids, or other diagnostic tests and other traits, I'm focusing for the purposes of, uh, of brevity on uh, atherosclerosis uh, and coronary disease, is largely actually a, a pre-disease marker, or even an early marker of the actual late stages of the disease. We've never really focused on moving much, much earlier in the process, despite the fact that we know that some of these traits are present even in teenagers or much younger than that. We've never really built any assays that allow us in an unbiased way to begin to focus on the earliest changes. And so what I'm really saying uh, in, in general as a, a generalizable principle is that because almost every disease trait shares these these fundamental problems. We focused on late stages, we focused on things that are really final common pathways. We're gonna have to reinvent almost everything that we measure in medicine, both in terms of the actual quantities that we measure, as well as the scale of what we measure. And if we're going to do that, we may as well do it in a direction that's beneficial. And that was really the core idea that we went to Google and uh, AstraZeneca and the AHA with, was that instead of measuring disease, what we should look for are actually positive measures of health undeniable uh, fundamental biological substrates of uh, a normal, um, well-maintained human body. And that turns out not to be very easy to define because almost every health definition that you look at is actually configured as the absence of disease. Uh, again, simply because of the incredibly narrow data set that we've focused on uh, in the last, um, well, I suppose you could say the last uh, couple of thousand years, but certainly in the last couple of hundred years. And so what we've begun to do is look really at the, the first three or four decades of coronary disease, almost all the biology. This is actually a diagram uh, that was drawn by my boss. Uh, and you can see here that uh, even although uh, the um, parts of the pathobiology of a blocked artery uh, are really the last 10 to 20 years of the disease, the diagram is heavily dominated by these. And the first 20 to 40 years are only given a couple of, of small slices. Uh, and ultimately, what we're trying to do is to take this generic early state to deeply dive and try and understand the core biology, uh, to move back into that uh, phase of wellness, and then to think about ways that we can scale many of these technologies to move to uh, not only populations who are uh, at risk and pre-disease, but also uh, to begin to stratify those who actually have the disease. There are a number of different um, sensors that we know already could potentially work. Uh, we've actually been working in this space uh, in heart failure for about five years. And interestingly, some of the things that allow you to stratify heart failure were some of the things that we began to imagine might be useful in coronary disease. So for example, one of the best stratifiers uh, in different forms of, of heart failure with a thickened ventricle turns out to be auditory evoked responses. Not documented in any records, but very easy to document in a very straightforward fashion. Similarly, stride length, uniquely, you can see here, there's an almost perfectly uh, tight uh, discrimination between uh, ischemic forms of heart disease and inherited forms of heart disease based on that metric alone, which is hard to believe, but nevertheless is actually, turns out, biologically associated with the distribution of the muscle abnormalities in these two conditions. And then recently, and this is all published work, uh, we, we identified abnormalities of the right ventricle that are present in the, in the skin on your face and the buccal mucosa uh, in your mouth, that you can actually not only look at the cell biology in a cover slip, you can actually look at drug responses without ever having to give the drug to the patient. So in coronary disease, we've begun to look in the first instance, although we're also taking an agnostic uh, uh, approach to looking at different uh, cell biological and molecular biological domains, is to look at the things that we know already uh, are abnormal in these individuals very, very early in the disease and begin to build uh, portable, wearable sensors around those, whether it's uh, imaging of the discrete patterning abnormalities in the retinal vasculature, uh, macrophage abnormalities in the, in the skin. We wait until they're so obvious they're visible to the naked eye, but it turns out you can detect these abnormalities in the skin of a two-year-old if you actually go looking for it and you build the right device to detect it. Uh, vascular abnormalities um, previously shown almost 20 years ago to be present in the teenage relatives of those with coronary disease. With modern tonometry and with the right metadata, we're beginning to identify the patterns uh, of vascular uh, responsiveness that actually are predictors of underlying coronary disease. And then the final thing that I think is important to mention is if you're asking yourself what are the best metadata, what are the metadata that actually apply all the way from a single molecule to a whole population, 
all the way through all the cell systems, the animal models, and everything in between. There are essentially only two things that operate at that scale. That's biophysical stimuli or small molecules. And most of the small molecule information that we have in medicine, we throw away, i.e. drug responses. So one of the most useful tools that anybody could possibly develop is a, is a mechanism for actually identifying whether people are taking the drugs, when they're taking the drugs, so that those metadata can be used in essentially every biological sensor that's developed. And so ultimately, the goal would be to build digital, uh, physical, computable barcodes that allow us to actually understand disease at its most rigorous fashion. One of the other things that we're trying to do as we're, um, and this is work that's been active in Brigham and Women's for the last, as I said, five years, is evaluate new devices and position them in the context of a broad set of diseases. But importantly, one of the other things that I believe you have to do is also evaluate the perturbations that are necessary to actually change the devices uh, from something that may have very little specificity to something that actually has quite high specificity. It also improves uh, for those of you who are interested in signal processing, in almost every instance, the signal noise ratio changes the linear dynamic range uh, by about a log and a half for most assays if you pick the right perturbation. And so we're doing this sort of rapid cycle development where we take in new devices, identify perturbations, uh, use them in disease-enriched populations in the clinic, and then move them forward uh, into the outpatient, regular outpatient clinic or home. But at, at all stages, really thinking, uh, can we begin to detect what are the generalizable roles for efficient scaling uh, to large populations so that these ultimately become ambient technologies. So this is the space that we're looking at, is this gap between the proteome. All of these are ready measured, uh, including exposure, but also thinking about how can we actually understand at a mechanistic level some of the passive characteristics of cells, tissues, organs, and organelles uh, that allow us to really uh, impact disease. Um, ultimately, the goal is to redefine disease through uh, identifying transitions from wellness. That was the actual title of the grant, Redefining Coronary Disease at the Edge of Wellness. Um, I, I, that was only because there was a, a limit on the number, total number of letters in the title. I'm not usually that lyrical. Um, and then the final thing to think about as you're imagining how all of this will work is to remember that almost everything that ever made it across the deck in medicine made it across the deck through implementation. And so a lot of what we're trying to do is begin to understand how can technologies essentially change the way in which we uh, envisage uh, moving uh, therapy to the patient. Uh, and one of the key elements in that, of course, is that the majority of individuals who have disease tend not to actually be very high digital adopters. So we've moved to a variety of different navigator-driven platforms that allow us with the right data inputs to manage incredibly complex cases simply with college-trained graduates who are supervised by pharmacists, RNs, and uh, ultimately MDs, although the pop-off uh, to an MD is remarkably infrequent. Uh, this turns out to be quite successful. You can uh, dramatically reduce LDL, blood pressure, a whole host of things. You can reduce cost by about 60%. But importantly, one of the things that we found that was quite important is you're also able to retain the human connection. And I think one of the things that's at the core of almost everything I'm sure you'll think about tonight is how do you, how do you begin to collect data and distribute uh, data as well as distribute therapies without impacting uh, that human uh, effect that we all believe is quite important. Uh, in maintaining health in particular. So these are my acknowledgments, a, a fantastic ecosystem in the Partners Healthcare uh, uh, portfolio. Uh, some of my colleagues uh, who are in this, uh, Malik and Jeff are here tonight. There really is an incredible uh, uh, amount going on. Ultimately, as I said, this has to be part of our ecosystem because we, our main overhead in the Partners Enterprise is based on research and development. We have to leverage that going forward and I hope that uh, some of you will partner with us to do exactly that. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. McRae. Um, so uh, up next, we have our, our main event, the challenge. Um, first, I'd like to introduce you to our four judges who will be listening to the presentations, asking the tough questions. Uh, we don't have the rotating chairs, we, we couldn't afford that, but, um, and, uh, and ultimately deciding on the winners. Uh, so first, uh, and please hold your applause till I've announced all four, I'd like to uh, bring up to the judging table Dr. Jeff Greenberg. Uh, Dr. Greenberg is the medical director of the Brigham Digital Innovation Hub and also co-founder of Firefly Health. And next I'd like to introduce uh, Laurie Lazara. 
who is Chief Technology Officer of Philips Patient Care and Monitoring Solutions. Uh, next, we have uh, Meg Barron, who is Digital Health Strategy Director at the American Medical Association. And then finally, we have uh, Dr. Malik Majmudar, who is Associate Director of Healthcare Transformation Lab at Mass General Hospital. So, big round of applause for our four judges. And now I'd like to kick it over to the judges uh, from your left to right uh, to give us a brief introduction. Sorry. Brief introduction? Yep. Uh, Jeff Greenberg, uh, physician and uh, 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 part of the team of the Brigham Digital Innovation Hub at Brigham Women's Hospital next door, and uh, also starting a new primary care company called Firefly Health. Happy to be here. Hi, Lori Lazera. Um, I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Philips, um, and uh, I'm very happy to be here as well. Great. So I'm Meg Barron. I'm Director of Digital Health Strategy for the AMA. So I work with our Chief Medical Information Officer, Dr. Michael Hodgkins, and we drive our digital health initiatives. Um, most notably and recently, we've recently built out a platform called the Physician Innovation Network, which in essence is a Match.com meets LinkedIn to connect physicians and health tech companies. And our end goal is how do we get the voice of the physician more heavily embedded into you know, all of the apps and solutions and technology that's coming down the pipe. Great. Hi, my name is Malik Majmudar. I'm a cardiologist at Mass General and also the Associate Director of the Healthcare Transformation Lab, which is a digital health innovation lab really focused on uh, improving the experience and value of healthcare for both patients and providers. Awesome, thank you judges. So quickly, if anyone came in a little bit late and you're standing and you don't want to stand, there's plenty of seats, so feel free to file down. Our first team to present is Luco Labs. Welcome Luco Labs. Hi everyone, my name is Ian Butsworth, I'm um, co-founder, co CTO of Luco Labs. And my name is Carlos Castro, today we will be talking about the first self-administered point-of-care medical device for non-invasive white cell monitoring. I wanted to start this presentation with a picture of myself with one of my best friends from Madrid, Miguel, who is standing to your right. Miguel and me were very close and this is a picture of us while we were traveling together in China. Unfortunately, a few months after this picture was taken, Miguel was diagnosed with an aggressive type of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. So this experience really exposed me to some of the challenges that these patients face on their day-to-day -day life. And one of the things that Miguel was most worried about was the status of his immune system, because that was, that was leaving him exposed to potential infections and delays in his treatment. And Miguel's worry was motivated because his immune system, that in this graph is represented by his white cell count, went from safe and normal values down to low values that if sustained for too long would put him in high risk of a life-threatening infection. Unfortunately, under the current standard of care, these patients get only tested once for their white cells, and that's normally right before their next chemo dose. So that means that for the 21 days that the cycle lasts in average, the patients and the doctors are mostly in the dark about the status of their immune system. So in the absence of this information, there are limited tools that the physicians can use to uh, manage this risk of infection that only increases the stress of these patients and also the risk of re hospital readmission. And just to put things in perspective, this is a huge problem that does not only happen to Miguel. In the US alone this year, 650,000 patients will start chemotherapy and 110,000 of them will end up hospitalized an average of eight to nine days because of one of these infections. This doesn't only have negative clinical outcomes, but also a high cost for the healthcare system. In Leucolabs, we know that this shouldn't be like this. This is why we are developing the first medical device that patients like Miguel can take home to non-invasively monitor how their body is reacting to the chemotherapy. 
Just to give you an idea, the triggering event to treat these patients currently is the fever. But at that point, it is already too late. So we are working to replace that by a situ for a situation where the triggering event is an indication from our device that the white cells of these patients are critically low, giving an opportunity for physicians to stage interventions. We actually talked to more than 25 oncologists in the process, and they told us that if only they knew this information, they would be able to prescribe prophylactic antibiotics and effectively manage the risk of infection. And what is also really exciting, if only they knew this information, they would be able to personalize the chemotherapy and tailor to every patient, improving their outcomes. So that essentially is our uh, mission in Leucolabs. We are trying to improve the quality of care for patients like Miguel. But we started by asking ourselves why this can't be done with current technologies. Uh, for one, all current technologies include blood sampling. And that requires patients of the uh, visits of the patients to the clinic for specialized personnel to perform the testing, which inherently limits how frequently this testing can be done. With Leucolabs, no blood is necessary. We've designed a simple three-step process that gives result in one minute and is uh, simple for the, for the patient with no blood involved. Uh, our technology is actually based on optical imaging of uh, microcapillaries under the skin of your finger. We are focusing on that area because it's a really unique anatomical part of your body. And capillaries are very superficial, allowing us to capture videos like the one you are seeing the on the screen. Uh, so each of those loops is one microcapillary. Uh, they are so actually so narrow that the cells must squeeze through them one by one. And because of the illumination that we are using, red cells appear dark, and we can see white cells as um, gaps in the microcirculation. It is by counting these uh, bright spots or gaps that we can get an estimate for the immune system status of these patients. This is the result of two years of laboratory research that we've led at MIT. And uh, we just finished a clinical study where we tested our prototype on chemotherapy patients. And we demonstrated that by looking at our data, we were able to identify the patients that were critically low, that had critically low levels of white cells versus those that had uh, safe and normal values. So with that uh, milestone achieved, we are really excited in the next 18 months to improve our algorithms and our prototype to get to a stage where we can do the, required, the FDA required trials and start um, selling uh, our units. In this process, we are supported by leading oncologists. We are funded by renowned institutions, and what is even more important, we have signed letters of intent from oncology clinics and international hospitals worldwide who are willing to acquire some of our units as soon as they are available. And when they are available, we will distribute them to these hospitals or clinics uh, who will list them to the patients for the duration of the treatment. We are focusing on accountable care organizations as a beachhead market. And based on prior literature, we've estimated that we can provide savings to them, to, to them up to 50% of their current hospitalization cost, therefore making the technology accessible and affordable for the patient. In executing this plan, we have an excellent team with expertise on the technical and the business side of, of, of this project. Between the six of us, we have participated in prior startups. We have published literature in the medical imaging space, and we have a track record of getting non-dilutive funding. We also have a supportive board of advisors with scientific and clinical experts and professionals from the medtech industry. But for us, helping patients like Miguel is only the beginning. We want to expand beyond chemotherapy patients and eventually assist the 10 million patients in the US that could benefit from increased monitoring of their weakened immune system. And ultimately, this could be a device in every American household, just like the thermometer or the blood pressure monitor, uh, allowing you to, or helping you to diagnose your loved ones when they are sick. But just before I finish, I wanted to share one, this last one email with you. This is an email that we got a few months ago from the father of a three-year-old boy called Mason. Mason is a leukemia patient, and he just got an infection in between chemotherapy cycles. So as his dad is rushing his kid to the emergency room, he's sending us this email to see if they could test one of our devices. And it's really emails like this that uh, motivate us to keep working on, on, on the daily challenges that we face when we are trying to bring this kind of technology to market. Uh, we uh, recently funded a company and we are working on spinning this technology out from, from MIT. So we are on that transitional process right now. 
So if you want to help us help patients like Miguel and patients like Mason, please come talk to us after this event. We are Leucolabs, the first medical device for non-invasive white cell monitoring. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Leucolabs. And now questions from the judges. So one of my questions is, is around your business model. How do you plan to, to make money? Who's the, who's the buyer? Who's, um, you know, what kind of price point are you looking at? Right. So uh, we, our assumptions right now is to focus on accountable care organizations uh, because they get, from our research, they get fixed reimbursement from Medicare. So if we help them to uh, lower their, their prices of treating these patients and lowering the hospitalizations, we, they have a financial incentive to buy in. So our current business plan is based on an assumption of $1,000 uh, lease cost per device and per patient. Uh, we are assuming that every device would uh, serve two patients a year with a life uh, time of three years. That would bring revenue streams for $20 million for one accountable care organization, one average accountable care organizations uh, treating 20,000 patients. Uh, that's, that's roughly, uh, there is also a revenue stream through consumables. So there is a consumable part to, in order to get quality data from the device. So that would provide an, an additional uh, revenue stream. I have one, first of all, uh, congratulations. Uh, I think it's impressive work and I can't believe having a non-invasive uh, way to actually check a white blood cell count is impressive. A um, couple of questions. One was you mentioned that you have evidence that you could segregate high risk from low risk or safe patients, but do you have data on the actual accuracy of comparing your white cell count to the other, and the reason I ask is in your capillary example, there's a lot of heterogeneity in the capillaries. Um, so how do you actually know what the white count is and do you actually have an absolute number or is it just a relative score? So the, this is a great question. Uh, right now, what we have, these are early days for the technology. So the data that we have is, uh, shows that we can give a probabilistic indication of whether patients are in this high risk area or not. Okay. We haven't got into, we cannot compare in terms of accuracy to the gold standard right now. Uh, and we, are, we have a, roadmap, a developmental roadmap to get into that, but what is really exciting for us that, is that even these early technical capabilities can make a difference for these patients. Yeah. I, just one suggestion, if that's the case, um, if your comparison is not the white set count, one thing you may want to do is to compare your product against fever and say that earlier detection of your score somehow improves outcomes since the early detection, early treatment as opposed to the traditional yeah. model. Yeah, that's an excellent suggestion. One, just a, a comment on that. One of the key things about our device is uh, that we envisage it being used as a screening device in the home, not to replace the gold standard. So if you imagine if a patient is at home, uh, this, uh, this device flags up an event, they go to the hospital and they still have a regular blood draw. So the accuracy required to have clinical action is still there, um, but we'd be a screening, a probabilistic method. Yeah, my question was really going to be centered more about the, the patient's experience with it and really what that... Um, you know, end-to-end -end, uh, looks like. My mom, unfortunately, went through chemotherapy just a couple years ago, and obviously not fun at all, so I'm just interested in the perspective more from the patient side. Well, I think that our, our aim is to have a single button device, um, a, d a device that you can put your finger into, press a button, it gives you a number. Um, our study so far has been done with trained operators. We have a, our initial prototype was one that required um, a degree of training to operate it. We have an ongoing prototype currently wor uh, that we're working on that is going after trying to get that single button device because we believe that that's key for the home setting. You know, this device on a table, sit at the table, put the finger in, and measure for a, a shorter period of time as possible, which is something that we're also trying to minimize. And, and following from there, uh, in the current, the way we envision this information being actionable is. Uh, for starters, we, we are trying to replicate what is happening in the current standard of care. So right now, if patients, they measure their fever, and if they have fever, they call their doctor, and at that point, they bring them into the emergency room. So for, I, I guess that for the initial deployment, we envision the same, uh, the same process, right? The, 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 I mean, again, the triggering wouldn't be the fever. The triggering would be an indication from our device that they are critically low. And at that point, they would communicate with their physician, and the uh, relevant clinical action would be decided. Um, can you comment on how, a little bit more on the device itself? Is this, um, is this a disposable device? Would patients be given this? Would they return it? Or is the secret sauce more in the algorithm and it's sort of a cheap device with an algorithm? I'm just trying to think of how this will work. 
Right, so the device, imagine it being a tabletop device. We don't consider the device to be disposable. The device will probably be owned by the hospital or um, you know, the insurance company. Um, but there is, um, as Carlos mentioned, a, a, a consumable piece um, yep. of, the, of the device that um, our current thought is that that's one consumable per measurement. Um, so it, it's uh, it, and, and it's it's absolutely necessary to in, ensure the quality because when you do these kind of hands-off measurements in the home, doing microscopy in vivo microscopy is very challenging, um, and we, it's necessary for us to make sure that everything is repeatable as possible. And in terms of the secret sauce, uh, there are there is a component about the device, as Ian was saying, like making sure that this um, data is acquired with enough quality to make the measurement. And then there is a part of algorithm, algorithms, then once you collect that data, how to extract the probabilistic indication from it. So those are the two components where we have IP. Great, thank you, Luco Labs. <laughs> Anyone who's just come in and still standing at the back, feel free to come down and grab a seat. Our next team, please welcome to the stage, NanoWare. Uh, thanks everyone for attending today. Thank you for Phillips and thanks for the judges for spending time with us today. Uh, my name is Venk Varadhan, co-founder and CEO of NanoWare. We're a New York-based connected self technology platform for diagnostics and chronic disease management uh, built upon our core invention of what we call cloth-based nanosensors. I'd like to introduce you to Edna, a uh, 67-year-old uh, patient that we met in our first clinical cohort earlier this summer. Um, Medicare patient, still working, grandmother of three. Uh, at about this time last year, during regular day-to-day -day routines, uh, an onset of uh, shortness of breath and chronic fatigue hit her uh, randomly and uh, went to the f uh, hospital and unfortunately was diagnosed with congestive heart failure. Uh, this is a condition that ultimately results from fluid accumulation in the lungs, which causes that inability to breathe. Um, how many of you have ever had the wind knocked out of you? Judges? Imagine if that happened randomly with no traumatic cause, and the only way to get your feeling of breath back is to go to the hospital for three to four days and get treated. Uh, that's the fear that Edna lives with every day uh, in trying to live her day-to-day -day life. And uh, the scary thing is, is that, uh, I'm sorry, my lines are messed up. Sorry about that. She's not alone. Uh, CHF is really spiraling out of control. We've got 6 million cases in America of diagnosis already with another 700,000 expected to be added annually. Uh, the economic burden is even more gloomy, $31 billion uh, in costs related to CHF with a really high expected taxpayer burden uh, all the way up to 100 billion by 2030. And because of this explosion in patient growth and cost, the burden of risk has now shifted to the hospital providers in really finding out ways to manage their patients and reduce those readmissions. And that's the outcome we're all sort of, I do apologize that the text is cut off. Um, CHF related hospital readmissions must be reduced. Uh, that's the outcome we're all striving for. But let me go back to the anatomy just quickly, okay? Uh, systolic patients, the heart muscle weakens. Uh, diastolic patient, the heart muscle cannot relax. So pressure builds up in the pulmonary artery, and to compensate for that, the lungs fill up with fluid. Our current standard of care is not working in reducing these readmissions because we may have an expensive implantable device that's measuring that pulmonary artery pressure. It's extremely expensive. Edna, who lives in New Jersey, just a month ago, uh, Medicare said that they would not reimburse cardiomems at all. Uh, and then if we're just looking for fluid accumulation in the lungs, like RF technologies or the early stage impedance space wearables, if you're detecting fluid buildup in the lungs, you're already too late. That patient's already decompensating and likely on their way to the hospital. We think we're building that, that need for that unmet sort of clinical outcome of reducing admissions with an affordable, non-invasive garment that can actually detect advanced uh, uh, decompensating heart failure weeks in advance of a hospitalizing event. Uh, by introducing our product, SimpleSense. It's an undergarment, sash-based product 
connecting to a mobile application, and providing a daily score to physicians. Daily green light, red light lets uh, physician and care management know if they're above or below threshold. First of its kind of analytical outcomes based on our cloth-based sensor technology. We did get our first FDA approval uh, in December 2016 for this technology. It's washable. It's capturing seven different metrics uh, that you can see across. Uh, and we're algorithmically scoring that to give the care management teams that daily score. We're not guessing on this thesis. Boston Scientific proved this in the multi-sense heart logic trials where they captured these same metrics by embedding firmware into one of their implantable ICDs. Uh, and uh, the lead PI of that study is actually our chief clinical officer, and he's leading our study. But real quick, I just want to dis just pause here for one second. Let's all agree on one thing real quick. We hear all this noise, especially from our friends out on the West Coast, about machine learning, artificial intelligence, a neural network that keeps learning that's going to save industries like healthcare. Let's call this what it is. It's data science. This is regression trends analysis. We've been doing this for years. But the argument is we have so much processing power that we can do these revolutions millions of times. And since we have terabytes and terabytes of data, we should be able to predict the future, right? Right? <laughs> Wrong. <laughs> Too much data isn't necessarily good data. If you've got dirt in your pipes, after 10 turns of the faucet, you're going to start seeing that coming out. What if that happens a million times? You're going to have probably more, more than dirt in your faucet. If you're really going to get better recommendations and better insights, the key needs to be at the very beginning, which is the sensor. How are we capturing data off the skin? The reason Gen 1 wearables reached a trough is because they blew by that first step. They focused on UI, UX, and they focused on analytics, and they said, as long as we're capturing a good enough signal, we'll be good. We really believe that we're doing that with NanoEarth, our cloth-based nanosensor technology, a solution that's actually addressing all four stakeholders. Patients, if we're asking them to manage themselves at home, it's got to be as easy as putting on your underwear. Physicians, for a cardiologist like Malik, it's got to be easy for him to see the score on a daily basis during regular business hours that he can trust the data and do care management accordingly. CMS, can it finally reach the Medicaid patient? Do we have a solution that is so low cost that we can hit the masses of the six million people? And then obviously hospital providers, we need to reduce these readmissions uh, so they are not getting that burden of penalties from, from Medicare. We are the value-based approach. CFH readmission is three to four days. Let's call that $10,000 on a DRG-related uh, admission, five to eight per year. Imagine if we reduce one admission for 1,000 patients for saving the system $10 million. If we hit 15% of the market, reduce one admission, just one, we're saving the system $10 billion. Great momentum. We're the only game in town with cloth-based nanosensors. We've piloted our scaled manufacturing, great IP firewall. The FDA approval is fantastic, and we just finished our first clinical cohort. The team is phenomenal, a very experienced team across medtech, global pharma, world-renowned research institutions. Uh, as well as uh, uh, material supply chain and venture capital. And I think the market's recognizing one last thing, is just how big can we become? If we can nail a disease state like CHF, what about our men and women on the battlefield? What about our first responders like our EMTs? What about automotive? What about the eventual empowered consumer? But if we can solve CHF and help Edna and the millions of other patients that are living with this incurable disease, altruistically, we can help them live the life that they deserve, and get back to living and not failing. Thank you, Anaware. <laughs> and now, questions from the judges. Congrats. Uh, great presentation, really important problem. Um, can you just clarify, have you tested this in patients yet? Yes. Um, and can you just talk a little bit sure. about Sure. So you found? we completed our first clinical cohort in August of this year. We did 24 sick patients, 24. Uh, healthy patients. As I mentioned, we're capturing seven metrics. We, we got two great findings from that. Uh, and this was actually over iterations on healthy patients. We actually changed form factor several times uh, to address differences in BMI, differences in gender, breast tissue versus uh, males, um, torso length, what have you. Once we figured we nailed that and solved an inventory management issue, making the harness adjustable, it's sort of a sash that comes across. We did test on sick patients. Uh, I think three really good findings that we had. Um, patients were able to sleep in this. This was comfortable. 
Uh, most importantly, uh, many of these patients have pacemakers or ICDs inside. We showed no fusion complex on the signals emitted from there. Of course, there's our signals. It's the strength of the sensor here. I'll pass this around. This is a sample of our yep. sensor technology. The feltiness you're feeling underneath your fingertips is the millions of freestanding nanopillars uh, per micron of surface area. And the third thing, Jeff, that we concluded from the study is that uh, most importantly, a lot of these patients with CHF, they have very different in, in skin brittleness, whether they're stage one to stage four. Some of them are so diuretic that their skin's really, really dry. Uh, we actually found a consistency across those patients. Uh, some had a little bit more settling time that was needed, uh, but the beauty about a cloth-based sensor is, is that relative to a silver server chloride electrode where 30, 60, 90 day monitoring is required, we're unaffected by body hair. Sweat actually makes it better as the pseudofluids mix with the body. As it gets used to the skin, our diagnostic yield increases. And even those patients with really brittle and dry skin, uh, after about 10, 15, 20 minutes, we were seeing very, very strong signals. Okay. There's, there's a couple, couple of questions for you. Please. Um, you know, non-invasive hemodynamic monitoring is like the holy grail in cardiology, right? So I think it's impressive. Um, talk to me a little bit about what is the FDA clearance for? Uh, because is it for just overall monitoring, or did you actually validate each of the seven metrics that you right. specifically mentioned? Because I'm obviously stroke volume, ICG, and a few of the things on here sort of, it's been challenging for other groups sure. to, to validate that. Sure, uh, great question, Malik. Our, our 510K clearance is actually for remote monitoring of conditioning, EKG, heart rate variability, and respiratory rate. Yeah. But, the, but the key about that, Malik, is, is that of the 2,400 page 510K, about 2,000 of that was on the sensor technology. FDA had never seen this before. We had to characterize this like crazy all the way down to the elemental level. Do mechanical testing for flexure, shelf life, we had to simulate sweat, we had to simulate uh, motion, we, had, we did a modified Bruce protocol. The beauty of, of getting that clearance is, is that the hard part on the hardware and the sensor is sort of cleared. The additional metrics that we need to add, we just need to add some reference devices. So for our sounds, we'll do a, we'll do a stethoscope. For your ICG, we'll do you know, a bio-Z or an impedance-based measurement. Um, what we are very excited about is the data set for our algorithm validation of that green light, red light score, which we plan on kicking off uh, that clinical trial of about three to 400 patients at three different sites in Q1, Q2 of next year. Great. Yeah. Um, clearly with data overload already and so much that you know, providers and physicians are having to just sift through already, talk to me a little bit about how the data um, integrates into a physician's current workflow. Sure. And our chief medical officer is actually here now, probably can answer the same question, says the same words, and I feel like people will probably listen to him more, but I'll say what he would say. This is already happening, right? With remote monitoring, with ICDs, with patches like iRhythm, cardio MEMS, even sensible medical systems, they're giving a score. It's a threshold green light, red light. We're not get at the point where we're giving prescriptive therapeutics yet by this green light, red light. We don't know that you have to add five milligrams of LASIK or an ACE inhibitor up or a beta blocker down. Uh, the data overload is sort of, we built our solution by being in the field and them saying, we don't want to flush into the raw data. We love these seven channels. Can you prove this clinically so I can trust this score and make my care management teams during normal business hours follow this trend if I increase their LASIK five milligrams, let me look at the score to the next day. Did it go back to green light? Or did it still try to regress? And can we bring them in for an office visit instead of them showing up to the emergency room? Can you talk a little bit about your business model? Do you think this is more of a hardware play uh, since it's so unique and novel, or is it sort of a service, a software? Like, what, what do you think the business model is? Yeah, for? another thing that gets me into trouble with our friends on the West Coast, uh, I don't believe this in this as a subscription monthly model. And um, based on our price point and a lot of work that we've done with, with private payers that aren't Medicare, Medicaid focused, and also hospitals like Hackensack Meridian, which is one of the places we'll be doing our trial uh, that are very Medicare, Medicaid focused. I think there's two business models. On the latter, uh, the DRG spread for a CHF uh, related uh, admission is about 12,500 or 14,500. Our price point for a three pack of these, they're washable, we give them to, to the patient at admission upon discharge, follow them for 90 days. Even, we're not willing to sort of point a, a price point yet, but if even we're at 500 to 1,000 dollars, we're within that spread of DRG, no problem. So we don't need a monthly fee on top of that. Uh, for the, uh, the non-Medicare pay uh, payors, they're already instituting population health bundled payments. Like a, a, a regional payer like Harvard Pilgrim, who you guys are familiar with, 
fiending for a, a thousand patient pilot where I'm just picking a number here, they would give one of their membership institutions 200 grand per patient. You keep them out of the hospital, keep the money. And they'll buy the devices directly. And that's really the business model that we envision, assuming CMS doesn't get to population health bundles uh, with CHF directly, which we can't really uh, predict with the new administration, unfortunately. So I really like your model of trying to get to something wearable and comfortable. I, I question a little bit, or help me understand your, um, you say it's washable, so how many uses can you get out of it? Sure. Uh, FDA really cared about this yeah. as well. Uh, we proved, um, again, everything under the sun, but we proved industry standard 50 washes with no compromise on signal fidelity. And that's why we would probably, over a 90-day period, give anywhere from three to five garments as part of the pack on just an overall price. Uh, so people aren't necessarily uh, having to do this, forget about the compliance. Compliance is the biggest issue when we think about remote monitoring. I think where we've addressed compliance, which I think is the crux of your question, is in two ways. Uh, a, it's cloth. So the minute that you get a rash or you have to prep your own skin or swap electrodes, which a lot of these patch companies have to do, you're just not going to do it anymore. You don't have to do that with ours. You just slip this on. We think we're going to collect data over a clinical trial overnight for 12 hours, but we do believe, based on the HeartLogic Multisense uh, Boston Scientific trial, that we'll, the patients will have to wear this for about half an hour in the morning when they're doing their regular regimen of compliance, their medication, weighing themselves on the scale. Uh, this is as easy as putting on your underwear, right? And we think that that is the solution as opposed to sanding your skin down, putting a uh, 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 even an implantable device at cardio you still have to lie down on that pillow for 30 minutes. And just remembering to do that at 24 hours every day is a little bit different than just slipping something on, in our opinion. And so, uh, if I understand you correctly, you only have to keep it on for 30 minutes, you said, or 20 minutes? We haven't minutes? proven that yet. That's what we expect. Yet. That's what we expect based on the data from Boston Scientific and HeartLogic. So, they couldn't run that implantable ICD for 24 hours. They actually ran into a giant problem with battery life and the defibrillator wouldn't work. Yeah. So they were just taking snapshots every 24 hours and they proved that 70% success rate over a thousand patients. Okay. Excellent, thank you, thank Nanoware. You. Thank you very much. <laughs> and again, anyone who's standing at the back, please feel free to filter down, we have plenty of seats. Our next team, I'd like to welcome to the stage, Sokya. How's it going? My name is Trevor Ross, and I am the representative for our company, Sokya, and our product is Healthy Age. Uh, Healthy Age is a smart home system with multiple, multiple t touch points um, that work in tandem to provide risk, uh, basically, basically the risk of patient, patient, uh, excuse me, I'm a little bit nervous, uh, patient uh, deterioration as well as uh, the requirement for hospital readmission. Okay, so here's our team. Uh, our company is Salkia, which is Sinhalese for health and wellness. Um, and then I met Hasi on the right in Spain while I was studying abroad. We worked on some IoT projects together. Uh, he brings a good engineering uh, mind to our team. Uh, Samudu over here, he, uh, he worked at WHO in assistive technology. He's, he's really great. He provides a lot of medical background that me and Hasi don't really have. And I'm, I'm basically a data specialist for the team, even though I don't really have any accolades to prove that. Um, the world is aging, as we know. I mean, baby boomers are starting to grow up, and they're getting old. So the, the elderly care market right now globally is evaluated at $7 trillion, and that's, that's, a, that's a big market, and we, wanna, we tend to capitalize on that. Uh, there's 98 million people. That's the projection for the age uh, of, of 65 or above by 2060 in USA alone. That's a lot of people, so we're going to need to get these, uh, these products out there. And then, 80, as you guys can read, 85 average life, life expectancy. All right, the issues that we're addressing is that um, there's aging population, so we're trying to limit the uh, patient deterioration, and we're trying to limit the amount of people that need to come into hospitals when it's, it's, not, it's unnecessary. Okay, so the market. Over the past decade, the wearables market has experienced a surge. 
except for the past few years, for a few years where the confidence in the market has experienced a dip, and that is due to the products in the market. The products in the market are great. However, they, they lack functionality, usage, and uh, data distribution uh, in, in different categories, basically. So for the functionality purposes, a lot of the, the a lot of the wearable technologies out there right now only focus on one or two metrics, for example, like heart rate and uh, temperature, just as examples, where our, uh, our approach is more holistic, where we, where we focus on a lot of metrics. Like I said, it's, it's multi-touches. There's, there's a lot of different products that we're rolling out right now. Um, and then a lot of companies produce great wearables with poor data distribution. So they give data overload where the clinician just doesn't really know what, it, what they're looking at. I mean, I'm sure they do look, know what they're looking at, but then the user doesn't. doesn't. And it's hard to, hard to read data, and people just don't know what's going on, so it's just hard to, to understand what's happening. Whereas our products have like a three-color system where it's, it's simplified, and uh, it's, it's green, amber, and red. And, and those are like warning systems, and they, they trigger alerts for the clinician and for the users. And that's backed by uh, machine learning algorithms, and it, it'll, it'll help, it'll, it'll continue to grow and grow and become better. So here's a, here's a sense of the, the competitors, and you can see that they're all great, they're all great products. However, they, they all focus on one or two different aspects of the market where ours doesn't limit that. It focuses on a lot of patients, and, and that increases the amount of customers that we have and the amount of patients that hospitals can, can, tr can treat. Okay, so our products. A lot, of, uh, a lot of products focus, like I said, on one or two metrics, where ours is a more holistic approach. The human body is a very complex, complex system, and you can't really obtain uh, perfect, accurate data based on someone's temperature. So ours engages, like, smart glasses. Uh, they look at uh, your eyes, and they detect eye movements. They detect abnormalities in your eye movements. If you're reading properly, they, they can see if, you, if your mind is deteriorating over time. They also have a built-in like EEG along the, the, the head of the, the glasses that uh, detects brain functionality. Our smart wrist wearable device works in tandem with the, with the glasses to make sure that the person's walking correctly. If they're stumbling around, we're, we're gonna know about it and the data's gonna show it. The smart toilet detects their, the pH and other levels of the urine and, and lets them know if, if, they're, if they're eating properly if, or if, if there's a problem with their, with their digestive tract. And the smart bed sheet lets us know if they're sleeping properly, if, if they're getting great sleep or if, they're, or if they're not getting great sleep. And like I said before, the, the three color coding system will show us whether or not this patient needs to be seen, needs to be seen immediately or is okay and, and they can continue about their life without coming into the hospital. Data, okay, so our data is gonna be great. <laughs> we, we're going to go through a smartphone app that has a great user interface, and it's going to be able to show you, show the, the patient and, and the doctor who's, who's treating them exactly what's going on in, in real-time updates with graphs and, and stuff that's easily to read, but also sticking with the color coding system so that way they know, okay, green, I'm okay. They, so they, they see a graph, they're like not going to know the numbers, but they're going to see a graph that says green, they're like, that's all right, I'm, I'm, I'm doing well. So it's going to have smart alerts that updates both the doctor and them if, if there's something wrong or if there's something that they need to check up on. Our, uh, our financial model is gonna be a subscription model. It's gonna be going through the hospitals where they purchase a subscription from us based on a, on a patient need base. So they're gonna, they're gonna determine whether or not a patient needs it or multiple patients need it and they'll, they'll, they'll dole it out to the patients. And if it's too expensive for the hospitals then the patients can can subsidize or the patient's insurance can subsidize. But the sub subscription model also helps us um, fluctuate and it makes us flexible in, in the amount of, of products that we're giving out and, and receiving back in. And it also obviously creates, creates great profit for us. Another great uh, addition to this is that our products are reusable. So after someone wears a wristwatch, bring it back in and we'll be able to, there might be some repair, but for the most part, we're gonna be able to reuse these products and it'll, it'll be a great system combined, everything all around. All right, that's, uh, that's it, thank you.
just clarify what what of this is yours? All these sensors, are you developing them? Are you using other sensors others have developed? Or is it the, the algorithm, the AI? Like, w w what is, we what, will, what do you guys add? We would add the algorithms, okay. and we would probably develop the sensors ourselves. Um, initially, we would probably outsource just to, just to keep costs low, but we would want to keep, to, to keep it in-house at some point just to keep long-term costs low. Okay. So, uh, you know, I picture my dad who's nearing, you know, 65, Mark, and it's difficult for him to switch just from, you know, eating healthier or whatnot. So, uh, obviously, I know you're, you know, hoping for the clinicians to almost prescribe this to them, right? Um, but talk to me about the motivators for the patient to make it feel like well, you're not getting old, but you yeah. still have, you know, autonomy over yourself and everything. I understand your case. We also have uh, an, an outright buyout program where you can, it's, it'll, it'll be more expensive, but like people in your situation who you're, you're, you're caring for your dad, you want him to be, to live longer, right? Well, I'm more so trying to motivate him to be healthier, but he feels like he's totally fine. So <laughs> obviously he thinks he's in great shape yeah. and still thinks he's 30 years old. So that's. So the like I said, you, you could buy our product and like make him wear the wristwatch and then he'll see the alerts that say, look, you're not walking properly. You need to, you need to walk more, you need to eat better. And, and that would help him out. Okay. I guess that's a good motivation. Yeah. So I have a question. So just Jeff mentioned this, right? You have this suite of products, either you're building them or you're sort of buying them for now. Correct. Um, What's the actual like go-to-market strategy? Like, what's what's the actual the clinical target population? What's the sort of the ROI on this? Our, our first our first target population would probably be people who are just recently released from the hospital. That'll help us get a, a good data data set, and that'll help us understand um, maybe some errors that we've been making in like the algorithms or the sensors. And that also that, that would also go in tandem with people who are in the hospitals themselves. So there's still nurses checking up on them, but they're, they're clarifying whether or not the sensors are working. They're clarifying. And, and then eventually the hospitals can trust that system and then eventually send it home with the patients themselves. So with respect to the, the comfort of the patient or, or even wanting to do this, glasses, like most people don't like to wear glasses at all. And if they already have a prescription, how does your, how does your eyewear stuff work with that? If they already have a prescription. Yeah, I mean, like, so how does the sensor then fit into their already existing s s uh, prescription? And how do you motivate them to want to even wear glasses at all? Some people don't like wearing glasses. I understand that. That's why we have three other things. But um, the glasses would probably be in more extreme cases for those who definitely need it. And those, th those would be, like, not prescribed, but, like, recommended by the doctor that they wear it at all times. And I understand the prescription uh, argument. And we would probably work around those with either prescription on the outside of the lenses, and we wouldn't we wouldn't install like the sensors that go out towards the public, in that case, or we would try and find a way to work with the contacts themselves. Just, just, just one comment of advice. I was going to say, I mean, it's, it's an interesting concept, but I would look at the competitive landscape a little more broadly than you did here. Uh, there are a number of companies in this space that actually have a combination of hardware that they send people home with and AI and solutions to actually automate the analysis of it. So look at Sensio Systems, Bioformis. Uh, there's a few companies that are similar, so it may be worthwhile. The, they're similar in the fact that they use AI to help with? Absolutely. OK. Yeah. Our, your argument is that we're different because we look at a more complex system of the human body to get more accurate data. I don't know, I don't know those yeah. exact companies, but I'm, I'm not sure if they use the amount of sensors that we have. Great, thank, thank you, you. Sokya. <laughs> Next, we have our fourth team of the night. Please welcome to the stage, Rying Medical. Hi everyone, my name is Rong. I'm here with Ring Medical. Our product is a wearable thermometer that provides connected health solution for monitoring and the prevention of patient deterioration. Did you know that 75% of the adverse event and preventable deaths occurred on the patient who are not monitored? 
Moreover, according to a CDC report, 20% of the healthcare associated infection are preventable and uh, which amounts to more than 6 billion US dollars annually. Finally, 58% 50, of the surgical site infection occurred around 10 days after discharge, suggesting a huge care gap of remote monitoring. Oftentimes, fever is the first and the only sign of an infection. To avoid the patient deterioration, CDC, um, CDC's guidelines of surgical size infection prevention recommend that the core temperature of the patient should be maintained within normal limits perioperatively and also need to be closely monitored after discharge up to 30 days after up to 30 days. The issue is the most uh, accurate size for the core temperature monitoring is also the most invasive. However, the invasive methods are not applicable out of the OR. And the, all the non-invasive offerings, they are not uh, continuous and uh, their measurement is only an estimation of the core temperature. Our product, iThermonitor, is a perfect solution for core temperature monitoring from pre-op all the way to the post-discharge. iThermonitor is the most accurate wearable thermometer and the only one has clinical validation in comparison to the standard invasive core temperature monitoring in OR. The difference is 0.14 Celsius, which is within the clinical accepted range. As of today, we have already collected more than 1.2 million hours of fever data and more than 500 clinical cases of core temperature data. The fast-growing database enables us to develop an advanced algorithm to ensure our measurement accuracy. The iThermonitor is a wearable thermometer with FDA 510K cleared, and it is worn under the armpit and transmits data every four seconds. The sensor transmits real-time temperature data to the patient monitor without disrupting the current practice. And our solution can be applied to any patient monitor on the market. For remote monitoring, our solution facilitates the seamless communication between providers and the outpatient by, by syncing the data to the HIPAA-compliant cloud and also sync to the data with the caregiver's mobile device. Now let's look at a use case of ISA monitor. This young girl uh, was using ISA monitor as a part of the study of, uh, conducted by MGH and Dana Farber. She was using ISA monitor for continuous bo uh, body temperature monitoring after chemotherapy with immunosuppression. As you can see that there are three um, temperature spikes after 16 days after discharge. You may also notice that the inconvenient times of the three spikes, for example, the first one, it was during the middle of the night and uh, during her sleep. If she was not using ice monitor and her parents only took her temperature every few hours, they may never have been known that she had a fever. You may also notice that there are some uh, minor spikes before her temperature breached the uh, fever threshold. And uh, interestingly, the timing of these uh, spikes were aligned with the period after chemotherapy when the white blood cell count is the lowest. We are working with research uh, collaborators to try to identify the fever pattern of neutropenia and capture the early sign of infection so the doctor will be able to intervene this uh, deteriorate situation at early stage to save tremendous medical, uh, medical cost. This is another ice monitor use case for surgical size infection monitoring after discharge. As you can see that um, the patient, 
the patient, uh, the temperature curve of the patient who developed the infection is totally different from the patient uh, who didn't develop the infection. And the more research data is needed to, to establish the individualized baselines and identify the fever pattern of surgical size infection for uh, deteriorate detection and prevention. This is another use case of eye thermometer for influenza outbreak surveillance. This article from American Journal of Public Health indicates that the data collected by eye thermometer uh, predicts the influenza outbreak one month faster than the China National Surveillance Pro Program. In the future, our goal is to convert all the multiple vital signs into a wearable, continuous way and provide AI solution for disease diagnosis, uh, management, prediction, and prevention. Our team has diversified the background of man, um, medical device, digital health, manufacturing, uh, R&D, and uh, fast-moving consumer goods. We have launched two wearable thermometers in the consumer market and have sold more than 100,000 units worldwide. We are very excited to introduce this technology into clinical field for patient uh, deteriorate, uh, deterioration detection and prevention. This is my contact information, and I'm happy to answer your questions. Thank you. Judges. <laughs> so one, congratulations on actually uh, having some sales already. That's fantastic. Um, so. One of my questions is when you get outside the, the hospital and patients are wearing this, how do you see your, um, your uh, information being added to an already existing ecosystem of a clinician? Because a clinician can't have all, all a multitude of disparate uh, ecosystems for every single measurement that there is. And so do you have open interfaces or how do you see that really working? Uh, to integrate into other um, um, platform, we have several options. We can provide the SDK to integrate our uh, Bluetooth library into third-party apps. We can also integrate the data because our mobile app is Apple Health enabled, so it can sync to sync the outpatient data to any platform that owned by the hospitals. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, that in the hospital for inpatient setting, we can integrate our data into patient monitors, so the data can be synced to the EMR without any obstacles. And what protocol do you use to sync it with the monitors? Ah, oh, you got me. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I wish my CTO is here with me. <laughs> no, no worries. I just have a monitoring company, so I was just curious. Yeah. <laughs> this is a good question. Quick question for you. Uh, you have a number of units that, that are sold already. I'm curious if you have any data on how much does, um, if you look at the fever trends, right? Yes. It's not even a fever technically yet. Is there temperature trends that actually predict fever onset? Because some of the graphs you showed, by the time it's 101, I think most patients will feel it themselves. You sort of don't need a thermometer to tell you uh, that you have a fever. So unless you can sort of predict it, um, how do you get the value out of it? And then also comment on the battery life and the cost. Um, well, I mean, temperature is just a standalone data. Uh, based on our uh, articles of uh, American Journal of Public Health, it's a combination of temperature data and the symptoms. We licensed a uh, fever management platform from Boston Children's Hospital and integrated into our mobile uh, app. That's why uh, we, were, we, are, we were able to um, come up with this um, influenza yearness um, index to compare with the China CDC uh, data. And uh, yes, the, you can change the battery. The battery life is 40 days with 24 hours usage. Um, the cost, um, currently we only launched in the consumer market. The price is $69.99 with five patches. And uh, for refill, 10, uh, 10 patches is $6.99. We may apply a different uh, pricing strategy when we uh, launch the product in the clinical market. We may be um, fo focusing on more um, uh, house data service rather than just uh, the sensor. Can you comment on how? Um, Sort of oh, pulling in from. Oh, thanks. Yeah. 
Um, the sensor, this is a patch. Gotcha. Um, thinking of Dr. McCray's talk earlier, mm -hmm. all the metadata that's out there and things that affect fever. Are people taking fever-lowering medications? Were they giving chemotherapy? Um, you know, who have they been exposed to? There's, you can think of many things that would impact their fever curve. Are you trying to capture that? Is that what this app does? How do you, it, or, or is this just fever in isolation by itself, disregarding all of that, um, has enough predictive value? Um, I think um, temperature obviously is one of the um, critical vital signs. And uh, currently, uh, there are so many uh, products out there, but none of them can really provide the validated temperature data to support the clinical decision. And um, uh, I don't think temperature alone can provide any you know, decision uh, support, but combine other uh, metrics such as uh, you know, blood pressure, heart rate, respiratory rate, it will be more valuable. But most of the time, especially for infection, fever is the only sign, especially for outpatient. That's why we want to invent, uh, you know, develop our future product to combine all the vital signs together. Mm -hmm. yeah. My main question really was around too, just integration with the EHR, but also um, curious of what like clinician or provider, you know, involvement you've had as part of, you know, getting to market like thus far. And also, I'm just curious of the story of why you decided to focus on this, of if there is one. Uh, there are many um, applic clinical applications of this product. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are currently in the uh, Texas Medical Center uh, Accelerator Program. They have a very um, great platform mm -hmm. for us to have the opportunity to get access to uh, different uh, fields to help us to figure out which is the landing field we want to uh, get started with. Because eventually, the wireless continuous monitoring, temperature monitoring will replace the current uh, thermometers at all, but uh, we need to figure out which we, we want to go first. Great. Yeah. Well, potentially, I think the pediatric oncology is, uh, is the best way. Okay. Great. Thank you, Rang Medical. <laughs> Excellent. We have two teams left. Um, our next team to present, please welcome to the stage Helbling Precision Engineering. How's it going? i um, Kevin Del Signor. I'm Slava. And uh, we're here to talk about a long-term oxygen therapy system called MOSS. This is not how you want to spend time with your grandfather. Um, when my grandfather uh, was on a long-term oxygen therapy system, it was uh, a struggle for him to do any activity. Even walking across the room was a burden on his lungs. Moss is here to change that. Moss is designed to relieve the burdens of patients on long-term oxygen therapy, such as those with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. As you may know, COPD is a widespread debilitating condition that is characterized by restricted flow in the air, or restricted airflow in the lungs. <clears throat> COPD affects the quality of life of millions of Americans um, and is the third leading cause of death in the United States. Um, it can lead to heart disease, cancer, respiratory infection, and ultimately results in costly hospital readmissions. Um, although there's no cure, long-term oxygen therapy can significantly relieve the burden and improve the quality of life for COPD patients. But long-term oxygen therapy is far from intuitive. Um, many patients are elderly, and although clinicians prescribe a flow rate, patients must ensure that they follow the prescribed usage and pay careful attention to their conditions day to day to ensure that there is no elevation in symptoms. This is your typical oxygen flow system. This system consists of a regulator, a nasal cannula, and 
involves manual adjustment by the, the patient. Uh, as you can see, external monitoring with a number of different wearables are available, pulse oximeters and all those, but um, none um, are normally logged, and if they are, it's, it's dependent on the patient to put that information in so that the clinician is updated. And while we're on the topic of updating clinicians, there are a ton of other smart um, solutions that have targeted COPD. Uh, we're well aware of that. Um, these solutions are often isolated or only look at a certain aspect. Um, the NIOV system here, for example, uh, you can change your oxygen flow rate based on activity, but it isn't smart, isn't connected, doesn't update anyone. Uh, smart dose oxygen conservers, um, they'll breed with you, they will adjust your oxygen rate while you um, are standing, for example, but um, none of them are connected, there's no vital tracking whatsoever, and it's really kind of left isolated in their own um, silos rather than being connected as a system. This is where MOSS comes in. So MOSS is a COPD management system that is closes the loop on oxygen delivery. Uh, and primarily how MOS differentiates for itself from the uh, conventional oxygen system are through a smart regulator and a wearable uh, device. The function of the smart regulator for the most part is sensing the breathing rate of the patient and delivering oxygen or only during the inhale, while the uh, integrated wearable is capable of sensing the state of the patient and um, delivering and uh, seamlessly adjusting the dose of oxygen in order to uh, uh, suit their activity level. So also unlike the conventional oxygen therapy devices, uh, MOS is capable of automatically tracking the patient vitals data uh, in order to uh, make it available for their care providers. Thank you. Uh, so overall, MOS is a smart therapy system that is capable of breathing and exercising with you uh, and is capable of tracking your progress over time. So from the user perspective, it consists out of two subsystems. You have the base system consisting of the oxygen tank and a connected regulator. And on the regulator, you have an LCD panel showing uh, the, some of the vital uh, important vital status of the user, such as this. PPM, his um, um, oxygen rate and uh, the oxygen blood concentration. And on the wearable side, you have to, it consists of two modules. First is the ear module, uh, that's effective. It's a pulse oximeter that seamlessly fits behind the ear and uh, clips into existing nasal cannulas. And then the other one is the uh, control module of the entire system uh, we call the pendant. And the pendant is effectively um, a control uh, module with uh, electronics and pressure and a oxygen um, administration valve. Uh, as well as a couple of uh, manual adjustment buttons for uh, the user to manual adjust if they so desire. So the core operation of MOS is consists out of is based on a three-layer um, uh, um, architecture. The first is the baseline operation. This is when the system senses your breathing rate and is capable of delivering oxygen only during the inhale. Thus, it functions in, as an oxygen conserver. The second loop is uh, we call adaptive action dosing. So what this does is it leverages the wearable sensors as well as uh, activity trackers on the patient in order to um, seamlessly adjust the oxygen dosage based on the activity level of the patient. So for example, if the patient goes for a brisk run or starts some exercise, the oxygen would, would, inc would be increased uh, uh, and decreased while uh, for, uh, during sleep or during resting state, for example. Um, and finally, the final, uh, the final state of the system uh, we call the warning state, and this is, um, um, this would, uh, the state would be triggered whenever um, any of the vital signs uh, of the sensor would go into abnormal levels uh, and be augmented with an audible alarm and instruct the patient to seek medical help. So finally, all of these are being logged in a data logging loop and all this information can be made available, made available to the healthcare provider. Um, but really, what's really exciting to us is that MOSS is a um, expandable platform for the future. So for example, one can envision uh, uh, different type of wearable sensors that could be implemented in the system uh, that could leverage the data acquisition and data management system uh, of the system in order to uh, generate and create more effective, more personalized treatment options for different patients. Uh, all of this data could be also uploaded to the cloud and made available to the clinicians in order to give them a clear, unbiased view of how the patient is really doing. Uh, rehabilitation clinicians for, uh, could encourage better exercise habits uh, to, the, to the patients as well as this data made available to the family members would enable them and empower them to take an active role in the rehabilitation of their loved ones. So overall, MOSS is a hands-off COPD management system. It allows you to conserve oxygen use uh, through its data collection uh, uh, management uh, architecture. It allows to detect patient iteration early. 
And therefore, what this uh, permits the patient to do is uh, schedule office visits as opposed to drop into emergency ones. So overall, we believe that it would reduce acute hospital risk with, uh, re um, readmission in general. However, it's not the reduced um, uh, medical burden in the system or the increased financial gains from the reduced admission that really drives us. For us, developing MAS was more on a personal level because when you really add all of these things together, what MAS really allows you to do is to spend less time in the hospital, spend more time at home, enjoying the things that you do, and ultimately spending time with your loved ones. Thank you. Thank you, Moss. <laughs> Judges. So can you talk to me a little bit more about the business model of who pays right now and, and, and the savings on the outcome or the, the other side of that? Uh, sure. With 21% uh, of Medicare um, COPD patients being readmitted to the hospital, our target is to reduce that number. Um, at $10,000 at readmission, if only 10% of those, um, per se, are um, reduced, so we would have a total of um, a, a good number of, a good chunk of money um, that'd be reduced. So. There's 1.2 million patients um, on COPD in the U.S., and if you take that number and you multiply it by that 10% that and 10,000, you end up with 1.2 billion market share just to, by reducing half of the readmittance. So I think that off the start would be a, a good target, um, but any, any savings and any early detection um, that we'd also catch is something that we haven't even calculated yet. So I'm going to add up a bit on that, actually. We believe so. One of, one of the important payers in the system would be the insurance companies because, again, as Kevin mentioned, they would reduce their burden and reduce their readmission overall, so they'll be more likely to uh, have, a big, have a better um, percentage of copay for the system to begin with, which would encourage people to get them instead of conventional oxygen therapy systems. Can you just elaborate on what, what is sensed? Is it O2SAT, I know? Is there anything else, or is it it's O2SAT? Uh, so at the moment, we have a couple of uh, sort of sensors that are built so built in the system. One is the, obviously the, the, the breath sensor, so sensing the breathing rate of the patient. So, that's so just respiratory rate as well. Respiratory rate, correct. Okay. Yes. The other one would be an O2, and a um, which uh, also encompasses a BPM, so uh, it's a heart rate monitor. Okay. As well as uh, at the moment, we're looking into incorporating a couple of um, essentially uh, exercise trackers, okay. which would uh, correlate the BPM and the uh, sure. S SpO2 levels with exercise levels. Makes sense. Do you, do, you <clears throat> do you have any clinical data yet? Have these been tried on patients yet? We do not have any data okay. yet, no. So maybe just to follow up, I, I understand you don't have any data yet. Have you thought about what sort of studies you're going to need to do in order to prove out the system? And my second question is, what part of that system do you own? Is it Because there's a lot of pieces to it, and I wasn't quite sure what is, you know, your offering as part of that. So let me ask you just the second part of this, uh, the, the question. Um, first, um, what we own is the, the concept. So it'd be the conglomeration of sensors and um, the data management system that would enable and empower the collection of data, and, uh, sort of the presentation to the, to the clinician. Um, we are an engineering con company, an engineering development company, and we uh, pride ourselves in developing medical products. And, um, this is sort of what we, uh, what we know how to do. Yeah, and to answer the first part, we'd envision a, um, a closed loop system in the long term, such as the uh, artificial pancreas, um, but on the sense of a long term oxygen therapy. So this system would always be tracking you and, and adjusting. Um, to, in order to roll that out, we'd have to roll out in stages. So we'd want to try and first target on uh, suggestion based. Uh, updates either to the pendant itself or to a, an app, and in which case user could then say, oh yeah, it, I, you know, I am walking right now, I should probably click this up another step to make sure I'm getting the proper oxygen dosage. And then if that proves to um, be better than your baseline standard system, then we'd work to try and get that up to the next level to have that fully automated system. So maybe just one recommendation on that if you're going to go to a closed loop is really partner with somebody who, who knows how to do FDA clearances. Closed loop is probably one of the hardest things to be able to prove with the FDA and would take a very long time. So just uh, be aware of that. Thanks. Uh, just one comment. So I think it's a really clever hack. Um, 
you haven't done clinical testing, but do you have any usability testing even from your, cons from your uh, customers? And the second question just around this issue is, um, are you at a prototype stage or most at a concept stage or do you actually have prototypes? Uh, so we're, we're in just the concept stage right now. Um, but I think our main target, I mean, we did a lot of background research to see if there's anything out there and we know there's so many wearable devices. We do not want to have something that had been thought up and already had 10 products on the market, you know. So with that in mind, we were looking at something and looking at our market really too, you know, a lot of these patients with COPD have been long-term smokers or, or elderly and with a system like this that's automatic for them, it's going to be a huge step above them walking over to the regulator and pressing it, turning it up. And most of the systems, like we said, um, touch on a, a certain part of, or a certain aspect of trying to make their lives better, um, but none really encompass it in the same way. Great. Thank you very much for helping. Awesome, and now we have one final team to present. Please welcome to the stage, Bold Diagnostics. That is not vanilla ice, that is queen pressure. All right, so I know that I am the uh, only thing between you guys and the bar, so I will try to be quick. Uh, my name is Ryan McGovern, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Bold Diagnostics. Uh, we're a medical device company based out of Chicago, Illinois, that's trying to shift the paradigm the way that hypertension is monitored and diagnosed. So it's estimated in 2025 there will be 1.5 billion individuals on this earth living with hypertension. That is roughly 20% of the world's population living with a disease that is a risk factor for heart attack, stroke, cardiovascular disease, and congestive heart failure. And in particular today, I wanna to talk about congestive heart failure, and in particular, readmission rates. Every year in the US, there's more than a million admissions for congestive heart failure, 25% of which are readmitted at an average cost of $13,000. It's roughly $3 billion a year spent and congestive heart failure readmissions. We know that hypertension is a risk factor for, for congestive heart failure, but we also know that if we can control blood pressure, we can reduce congestive heart failure readmissions by up to 26%. Lowering blood pressure by 20 points creates a 26% reduction in CHF readmissions. But why aren't we doing this? It's because the clinical community does not have the tools that they need. It's because of this. This 140-year-old technology that Dr. McRae said at the beginning is one of those legacy 19th century devices that provides incomplete information. It's a discrete, intermittent snapshot trying to measure a continuous variable. A lot of solutions have come to the market, some with success, but not each with their own downside. This wearable device based on pulse transit time is expensive. It's roughly $6,000 and has a minimum of 30 beds for an inpatient setting. This accurate oscillatory method requires a trained clinical physician or nurse and is not continuous. The continuous solutions are, again, affordable and not practical. This will turn your finger blue within 15 minutes because it cuts off the circulation. It's a vascular unloading method. And finally, the inexpensive solutions are just not trusted People don't like them. They don't want to be associated with high blood pressure. They don't want to feel old. But Bold, Bold has developed the first device and solution that is a continuous, ambulatory, inexpensive solution for the outpatient market. Our solution is based on a novel physiological parameter called the Differential Pulse Arrival Time, or DPAT. Our system consists of two patches, PPG, green PPG sensors, one worn on the left arm, one worn on the, on the right arm. These are disposable Bluetooth-enabled patches. They measure the arterial pulse waveforms, extract features using machine learning, and then, in addition, they measure the physiological parameter DPAT. Together, we combine those into signal processing to create a rep reproducible blood pressure measurement. We've shown this at Northwestern University. We conducted a clinical stu uh, study under our IRB, 
of 25 patients, and we were able to reproducibly show against a control device, a finipress, that our margin of error was plus or minus six millimeters of mercury. Our value manifests itself in five ways. First, we're a non-obtrusive patch that allows our patients to be ambulatory. Second, we're inexpensive. A two-patch kit is only $40, or our, our COGS are only $40. Third, we provide continuous beat-to-beat -beat monitoring. That means with every heartbeat, we have a new blood pressure measurement. Fourth, this device can be used in any type of patient and anywhere. So unlike the Cardio MEMS device, which is good for only Category 3 congestive heart failure patients, ours could be used in Category 1, 2, 3, or 4. And when you take all four of those features and you combine them, you're able to generate pathophysiological, actionable results for a clinician, and that is where the real value comes. We did a bottom-up approach on our market. We looked at inpatient hospitalizations for hypertension. It's roughly $2.6 billion. We think our serviceable market would be those at high risk, which is roughly $657 million based on a $150 price point. Our go-to-market strategy is really three phases. First, we're gonna obtain FDA 510K clearance. We've engaged consultants to help us with that. We'll launch in the Northwestern a hospital system. We have an IRB in place at the university. We have a data use agreement, and their value analysis committee has championed our device. We will get paid in two ways. We'll take a two-pronged approach. First, we're going to try to slide under an existing CPT code for hypertension. In parallel, we're going to pursue a Category 3 and then a Category 1 CPT code with a rough price point of $150. Our business model, again, is based on a prescription of a two-patch model for roughly $150. To date, we've conducted, or we've built and tested three prototypes. We've conducted a clinical trial of 25 patients under our IRB at Northwestern University. We've raised $355,000 in non-dilutional funds through the National Science Foundation and other business plan competitions. Going forward, we're looking to raise a $1.8 million seed round to complement our NSF phase two to build out our beta prototype and our back end. We have a very strong team and we are positioned well to do this. And forgive me for the lines. Uh, we have a great mix of clinical background, business background, engineering background, and industry background. Prior to business school, I've been seven years developing optical-based sensors. We have clinicians, cardiologists, and PhDs with numbers of publications. Our advisory board consists of world-class cardiologists, venture capitalists, and successful healthcare entrepreneurs. We've also been recognized by a number of organizations, most notably the American Heart Association won their Innovation Challenge Award in 2016. Uh, we're part of a matter incubator out of Chicago. And so we think that we are positioned very well to shift the paradigm of how hypertension is monitored and diagnosed, and thank you for your time. Over to you, judges. So, great, great presentation. Thank you. Um, can you just explain why the need for continuous monitoring? And then why did you test against Phenopress and not at A-line? Sir, what was the last part? Why did you test against Phenopress as your gold standard and not the arterial line? Yeah, so that's a great question. So let me start with the, the second. The Getting an iron in B place and for an invasive test is much more work. We were able to, our, Co-founder Jay Panet is a cardiologist at Northwestern, and we were able to get our IRB through very quickly and get some data really fast. We do plan to go to an arterial line that is the gold standard, and that, that is absolutely in our pipeline to accomplish that. Um, in terms of continuous, we believe that making a, a platform of continuous monitoring is really where the value comes. Yes, we could take a snapshot of a patient every day or once a week, but Blood pressure varies, you're familiar with nocturnal dipping through the night and through the morning, and that's a very, that can be very predictive. So we feel that getting that continuous data and getting it into a system that can, the clinic can look at, the, or the clinician can look at, can really help create, uh, or, you know, the clinician can use it to help intervene before critical events happen. Uh -huh. Great presentation, I would, I would just add, a-line may be the gold standard for measuring blood pressure, but I think your gold standard is clinical outcomes. So I, I don't know that you need to run a study with A-lines. I would run a study showing you actually improve clinical outcomes, and I don't really care how accurate the blood pressure measurement is if it actually improves clinical outcomes, um, in a sense. Um, it, I'm trying to think of how I'd best want to use this as a, as a doctor. I mean, if you could get the price point down, this would be great for just 
managing high blood pressure. Yeah. It could be great for someone is sick and I just want to know what their blood pressure is right now. Um, but it's hard to give someone an expensive device that they're just going to use once in a while. Is there another model? Could you either get the price down to 10 bucks, or is there a model where you send this out to people and get it back so they just have it for a point in time? Very few people need it all the time, to, to Malik's uh, point. Yeah, so, so we've gone back and forth about the, the platform system. So our, you're familiar with the PPG sensors. They are ubiquitous. They're in every single wearable device on the market. And you get huge economies of scale. So yes, you, we could push prices down to $10, but you would lose things like connected to your mobile phone or connected to the cloud. So you'd sort of have to start pushing costs away from these Bluetooth or integrated electronics that I think provide a lot of that connected benefit, right? We're going towards a connected world. And just to push the cost down to 10 bucks and then say, well, I'll get, it, I'll get the data from you at the end of a month, that's great. But you know, in three years, I bet we'd have the conversation that says, yeah. I want it now. I made up 10 bucks. I guess my only point is I see you're focusing on heart failure because they're really expensive patients. Yeah. I think there's huge mass market appeal to this if it could either be cheaper or in, in some other model where it is cheaper for an individual. That's all. Yeah, yeah. I appreciate that. Um, quick question similar to the others, but how is the data like received, right, from the clinician standpoint? And does it integrate into the EHR? Like how, you know, what's that experience between the patient and the physician? Yeah, so we, we're modeling our approach after that of the Holter monitor and event monitor. So we envision somebody being prescribed this, you know, outside of congestive heart failure in the, in the cardiology clinic. You go home, you wear it for 30 days, you come back, you have the cardiologist sees the report and is able to interpret data from that report to provide a more robust diagnosis. Uh, so into the EMR, like back of an epic, epic system or, you know, something, but that's a, that's a sort of a longer term goal for us. Got it. And I was just going to build on what was already said about the manufacturability of what you're doing and trying to figure out if you really can get those price points down. So I do think that is going to be key to your success um, yeah. overall. Thank you. Yeah, for the $40 is what we, we literally paid. So and, and we made like, you know, a handful of them. So but how easy is it to manufacture at scale yeah. is really the question. Yeah. Uh, so we just applied to an accelerator in China and hopefully we'll be able to learn how to do that. <laughs> Great, no more questions. Thank you to these six fantastic presentations. Judges, please take a moment to finalize your score sheets. And Jim and Abby are going to be over to collect them. While they're doing that, we're going to hear from Ravi Kuparaj. <laughs> business leader of Philips Connected Sensing Venture. Please, big round of applause for Ravi. Hello. First of all, another big round of applause for our six finalists. Woo! Boy, oh boy, that was quite a treat. What a variety of presentations, you know, right from content to where they are in their life cycle. Uh, oh, it's, it's, it's good to be, uh, I, I guess, young and uh, not knowing what you can do sometimes. <laughs> well, uh, it's year two for the Philips Wearable Challenge and year two for Connected Sensing as well. It seems like just the other day when a bunch of us upstarts got together in this newly formed fledgling at Philips called Connected Sensing and how we can kind of bring our ideas from the past of innovating in the wearable space, in healthcare, in the IoT space, in other industries, and so on, and say, hey, what can we do to really change the landscape in healthcare? Because as, as you know, Philips has got a long history of innovation right from the light bulb days. And as you know, Philips got a fantastic global footprint in critical care monitoring. But as you look kind of outside critical care, in other care areas of the hospital, and frankly beyond the hospital as well, you can see where more and more of our healthcare dollar is being spent in the lower acuity areas. And as more and more people with chronic diseases are really coming through the healthcare system, that's playing a huge burden. And we already saw a lot of ideas today addressing that same space. And we thought, hey, if we could somehow find the right set of solutions to address this space, wouldn't that be great? 
And that's how we got started. And from very early on, we realized that it's something that we can't just do by ourselves, not connected sensing, not even Philips by, by, by ourselves. It's got to be an ecosystem play. And what we wanted to do was, can we find a way, a forum, and a medium that we can engage the entrepreneurs of the world who can come together and innovate? And that's how the first wearables challenge started last year. And we were overwhelmed by the response last year. And we were overwhelmed last year, even more so this year. We had, we got about 25 or so entrants last year. We almost doubled that this year. We got over 75,000 views of the contest website this year. And over 2,000 people voted for uh, really the finalists today. So thank you all for everybody who participated through this whole process. So I want to give you and all of you in the audience a big hand as well because your support means a lot to us and more importantly, your support means a lot to the entrepreneurs here today. So thank you. I want to thank the judges as well. Um, you know, you've got an interesting job at hand. Um, and uh, uh, I think some of the insightful questions will be incredibly useful to the people here, the entrepreneurs here, maybe even much more valuable than the check which some of them will receive. And there are not going to be no losers here. I think you're all winners here. So with that, um, I want to hand it back to, to Metro and the judges with one thought. Uh, continue to think bold and different because healthcare is hard. It, it's not easy. It takes a lot of gumption. It takes a lot of money. It takes a lot of time. There's FDA, all of those things. But I remember, I'm reminded of one proverb, if you always did what you did, you'll always get what you got. So you gotta think differently. So I, I admire you for the ideas today and keep them coming, thank you. <laughs> do we have the winners? We do. <laughs> we do. Before we announce the winners, I just want to say very quickly that this amazing event took a lot of work and dedication from the MedTech Boston team and from the Philips team, who have been working tirelessly for the last three months, meeting weekly to prepare for this event. So a special thank you to Abby Ballou, Managing Editor of MedTech Boston. <laughs> Nick Morewood, Strategy and Business Development Leader for Philips Connected Sensing. Nick, where are you? Nick. Back there, yes. Big round of applause for Nick. <laughs> and Katie Consavo, Senior Managing Manager of Global Marketing Communications at Philips. Katie is here somewhere. At this time, we'd like to invite the Philips Connected Sensing Ventures team and the judges to the stage as we get ready to announce the winners. Uh, Nick, I think you need to come down. <laughs> so we're going to announce each winner, hand out the prize, um, and we ask that all finalists and winners stay close for photos immediately after. Uh, not, not until the final. Okay. Um, we have, have a bit of a unique situation that we haven't had before. Um, we're going to start with third place and then go up to second and first. Uh, we actually have a tie for third place. So um, please uh, congratulate with a warm round of applause our two third place winners, Luco Labs and Bold Diagnostics. Thank you. Congratulations.
In second place, a warm round of applause and congratulations to Rang Medical. <laughs> I don't have a drum roll sound effect, but um, imagine a drum roll. In first place, the uh, big award of the night. Please congratulate with a warm round of applause, the winner, Nanoware. Great. Well, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we have coffee and desserts served out front. Feel free to stay around and mingle. Oops. Oh, one last uh, announcement. Sorry. Uh, Shout out to Jay Day, who's uh, kind of been instrumental in working the scenes behind to make this all happen as well. Thank you, Jadev. Thank you, Jadev. <laughs>